Hey guys. Um, so next up, uh, we have got Beth McPhail. Uh, Beth is an experienced designer in the strategy and design team at Silver Stripe here in Wellington. Uh, Beth loves the challenge of helping clients identify their users' problems and finding creative ways to solve them. She enjoys all things discovery and UX, whether it's running workshops or designing interfaces. She's also passionate about accessibility and making the web an inclusive place for everyone. Fun fact, Beth is a yoga teacher and an avid trail runner. Let's give her a warm welcome and show her some emoji love. Over to you, Beth. Cool. Um, hi. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then I will get started. Awesome, cool. Cluttered interfaces, stark contrast and Dell visual design. For many, this is what comes to mind when you think about web accessibility. And if you visit the WCAG website, well, it doesn't exactly inspire creativity. Kia ora koutou kato, welcome. My name is Beth and I, oh, there we go. My name is Beth and I'm going to take you through my checklist for how to stop box ticking web accessibility. As I'm now coming to you from a little box in the corner of my screen, I thought I'd take a moment to tell you a little bit about me. I was born in London and I spent the first 10 years of my life living in the UK before my family moved to New Zealand. My dad is a Kiwi. I have now lived here for the majority of my life and I get feel super lucky that I get to call Atira my home. I live in Wellington and so that is where I'm coming to you from today. As a child of the 90s, my design career of course began with a deep love of Microsoft Paint. Um, as I got a little older, the obsession was transferred to word art. Here is a little taster of my year seven homework book. After I left school, I studied visual communication design at Massey here in Wellington, where I figured out that UX design was a real job and I landed in the wonderful world of web. I may have swapped my gel pens for a MacBook, but the six-year-old in me gets legitimately excited whenever I get paid to draw a picture. I work at Silverstripe as an experienced designer in the strategy and design team. Silverstripe is a digital agency and a content experience provider here in Wellington and also in Auckland. Um, I lead design and discovery projects with a range of clients where I'm involved with everything from running workshops to solving UX problems and creating UI designs. Here is a picture of me looking professional, but it is far more likely that you're gonna see me looking slightly uncoordinated in the bush somewhere. This talk was inspired by an accessibility improvements project I worked on last year with Waka Kotahi, the New Zealand Transport Agency. I got the opportunity to work with their in-house accessibility expert, along with our awesome dev team to improve the accessibility of their main website. Making a website accessible is definitely an ongoing process, but the project was a success and we managed to make some really key improvements across the whole website. We worked together to figure out how to create the biggest impact on a large and super complex website. It was a great learning experience and it really set the standard for how I now approach accessibility in all of my client projects. It is required for new, all New Zealand government agencies to comply with WCAG 2.1. It has been for a while now, but there are still quite a few websites that aren't quite there yet. Standards are a good thing. Awareness is growing and the accessibility of websites is improving, but it has led to a whole lot of client website clients who know that they need their site to be accessible, but don't really know what that means. Accessibility has become a box that needs to be ticked and I think it's a bit misunderstood. So what is accessibility really? Before we get into the how, I want to come back to what accessibility really means. Its definition is the qualities that make an experience open to all. Sometimes there's a bit of a problem with this approach. The weight is putting up, put on just making it possible to everybody, not necessarily easy, intuitive or enjoyable, just possible. Checking boxes and meeting standards will technically make things more accessible, but in the process, we can forget the why. It's about people, not just standards. Accessibility doesn't live in isolation. In the world of web design, accessibility is a key part of usability and user experience design. And it's also part of the wider concept of inclusive design. 
If accessibility is making it possible for someone to attend the party, for example, having wheelchair access, inclusive design is everything that goes into making someone want to put on their party clothes, leave the house and lose themselves in the music. And this will look different for different people. Inclusive design doesn't mean you're designing one thing for all people, you're designing a diversity of ways to participate so that everybody has a sense of belonging. Inclusive design is a lot larger than accessibility, but bringing an inclusive design mindset to accessibility might help to balance out some of the current issues we have with how we approach it. So, what is beauty? Imagine that you're designing clothes, you're creating active wear leggings. The pattern and colour are fun, the fit looks great, but as soon as someone tries to move, you realise the material isn't stretchy and they can't even sit down, let alone exercise. It doesn't matter how great they look when they're standing still, the leggings have failed to be functional and that's not beautiful. Know what you're designing for. Beauty means different things in different contexts. A poster for a music festival is going to be very different to the event page where you buy the ticket. The poster captures your interest, gives some high level information, puts it in the forefront of your mind. But if you, if you can't find or remember a key detail, that is okay. You can head to the website. But if you can't find the location or the price on the website, well, that's a problem. Beauty means different things in different contexts, but in reality, it's just good design. So how do you make it beautiful? These are things that have helped me and the teams I work with. Accessibility best practice is continuously evolving and I'm sure in six months time, this list will look different. The number one thing that will make experiences you are designing for more accessible is to test with and speak to people with lived experiences. But not every project has the timeline, budget or resources to make that happen. And that doesn't mean that you can't still make an impact. On every project, no matter how big or small, there's a point where it's just you and your design file. You've got to decide on tick sizes, button colours and focus dates, and you're all on your own. This talk is for that moment. Number one, start with people. You may be picking a button colour, but people are going to be clicking that button. This is a super obvious one, but start with people and then keep them in mind throughout. The bell curve was first used to measure human experience in the 1800s. It helped people to understand the uncertainty of human society, and it has heavily influenced the way in which we design. But it creates the mindset that if you focus on the average person, then your design should work for the majority of people. It creates the idea that there's this sort of mythical normal person that we should be designing for. In her book, Mismatched, Kat Holmes talks about the design of the very first fighter jets. Hundreds of measurements were taken and they calculated the averages and then designed the cockpit. But they were still having a high number of unexplained crashes. A researcher picked 10 of the average human measurements that they were using to design the cockpit and compared them with the actual measurements of 4,000 pilots. Not a single pilot matched all of the dimensions. The cockpit fit nobody. Designing for the averages can mean designing for everyone and no one. In 2011, the World Health Organization referred to disability as not just a health problem. It's a complex phenomenon relating to the interaction between the features of a person's body and the features of the society in which he or she lives. Using the averages approach can have a negative effect on everyone, but in particular people who sit on the edge of the bell curve who will experience the greatest mismatch. Designing for the edges can be useful as a place to start when creating more inclusive solutions. However, focusing on averages also creates the idea that human experience is binary. Either we experience a mismatch or we do not. This is not true. Everyone experiences mismatches at some point, whether it's permanent, temporary or situational. The persona spectrum is a quick tool to understand related mismatches. Being born with one arm is permanent, having an injury is temporary, holding a baby is situational. Being deaf is permanent, having an ear infection is temporary, or working in a bar is situational. The Microsoft Accessibility Handbook speaks for solving for one, extending to many. By recognising how everyone experiences exclusion, we can understand how designing for someone who might experience an extreme mismatch can benefit many others. This is also how you get buy-in. When you tell a brand team that no, even though orange is your primary brand colour, we cannot have orange buttons with white text anywhere on your site. There's going to be pushback. 
Making your site accessible just makes good business sense. It will benefit all of your users. Putting too much value on averages can make inclusive decisions feel not worth it. But this idea is built on the assumption that accessibility only improves experiences for people on the edges. If you start with the people using your site, then by default, it's going to be more accessible. When you begin designing, including more contrast or visible links will feel more natural because you have a reason to. Number two, think about accessibility throughout the design process. Many definitions of inclusive design speak of the very early stages of the project. To have the greatest impact, this is true, but designers rarely start with a blank canvas. This is the world I come from. Sometimes I get to be involved from the very beginning of a project, but most times we get involved once the solution has already been determined. Whether or not the process has been inclusive so far, and of course I encourage you to advocate for that wherever you can, sometimes all you have is WCAG, a list of requirements, no time, resources or budget. I'm here to encourage you not to give up. Every part of the process has space for impact. Here's an example. When I'm designing a website, I decide on the different heading styles that a content author can pick from. To ensure that a website works well for people using a screen reader, it's really important that the hierarchy of headings are followed. After designing a site, I was finding that a specific content team was always skipping H3 styles, opting instead to bold the line of text. We realized it was because they felt that the style was too big. We slightly reduced the text size. They agreed to start using the correct headings to tags. This is a pretty small UI tweak, but if you're designing a site that has 600 plus pages that are entirely created using H4s and bold text, little things matter. The point being, there is space for impact throughout the entire process. A product owner, you can request an alt text field. A UI designer can make sure to add in a focus state design and a content author can make sure to use the appropriate heading tags. Number three, know how to read success criteria. The WCAG standard is super confusing, but I found it really useful being able to navigate through it. There are three different parts of the site. The standard itself, which is made up of individual success criteria, understanding pages, each of these success criteria has an understanding page, and techniques, possible ways that you can meet the success criteria. There are many different techniques, and something that's useful to know is that you do not need to meet every single one of them to meet the success criteria. There are three things that I look for when I'm trying to figure out what on earth a piece of success criteria means. Purpose, context, and keywords. Understanding the purpose. Here's an example. This criterion is what will often result in underlining links, but the criterion itself doesn't explicitly state this. It explains the desired outcomes, which means that there are multiple ways that you can achieve them. To be able to decide an appropriate solution for you, your use case, you need to understand why. This is why the um, understanding page is a personal favourite of mine. It includes a section on the intent and also the benefits of me meeting the success criterion. Intent of this site criterion is to make sure people who have trouble viewing colour are still able to understand the information on the page. For example, if there are validation errors on a form, a colour change is not the only way that the information is conveyed. This will benefit many people, including someone, using, someone who has color blindness, low vision, older people, or even someone using a monochrome display. Think about the context that you're designing in. All the other UI components, the web pages, the text content, they all have an effect. UI elements don't live in isolation. Using the link example from before, this is a possible technique. Ensuring that additional visual cues are available when text color differences are used to convey information. In the context of links, this means that when you have some content that's a link and other content that's not, you need to provide a non-color visual indicator. This could be an underline, for example, in a paragraph. But there's other contextual information that should be taken into account. For example, if you've got a side panel that's entirely made up of links, then you don't need to underline them. The location alone gives enough information. Same goes for items on a menu. Your links don't live in isolation. Blindly following a standard can also have a negative effect. Having 100 underlines on a page can create an overwhelming feeling, increase cognitive load, and reduce the usability of the page. And it just might not be needed. My final tip is to take note of keywords. This example talks about line spacing. 
it says it should be at least 1.5. I've had people quote this requirement back at me before, interpreting it as a blanket requirement for all text anywhere on the site. 1.5 paragraph text is great, in fact, one of my preferred line heights. But if you've ever seen it used for headings, um, lists of links or labels, it can look messy, unfinished, and depending on the page, really confusing because it becomes hard to distinguish between different sections. And that's because the criterion was never meant as a blanket rule. It was only meant for blocks of text, which means more than one sentence. The catch is that whilst applying certain techniques across the whole site might seem like you're making things more accessible, it's never actually that simple. Ask why and then work together. Knowing how to read a standard sets you up for this one. Be informed enough to ask questions and work collaboratively. You don't need to be an accessibility expert, but you need to know the role and perspective that you bring to a project. Often, accessibility testing happens at the end of a process. You just get requests for specific changes to designs without any context. Removing silos means that we can bring an inclusive design, UX and visual design lens to meeting accessibility standards. As a UX UI designer, there'll be things that you pick up on that an accessibility auditor will not, and vice versa. As I talked about before, there are many ways that you can meet success criteria. When I get a request for something to be changed, I always ask for the link to the specific criteria. There are a few reasons for this. Firstly, it's an opportunity to get a better understanding of why the design didn't meet the criteria so that you can create more accessible designs in the future. But also, it gives context as to why the suggestion was made, which creates an opportunity for finding a different solution that might work better with the rest of the designs. For fun, here are a few things that I've been told are not accessible. One, you've not had, you cannot have columns of text. Everything must be in a single block. Two, hamburger menus, they're not accessible. Absolutely all text must be left aligned. And you cannot have text on images ever. When you don't ask questions, things can become a little bit restrictive. Mostly, these are things that someone's been told is not accessible in a specific context, usually just because it's not been implemented in an accessible way. Um, they've then made the assumption that it isn't accessible at all. If you don't know when to ask questions and question things, then you're going to end up removing a whole lot of possibilities. Number five, keep it simple. And that doesn't mean minimal. We all want to make things easier to reduce cognitive load. And the first thought is often less is more, but sometimes the more you remove, the harder it makes for somebody to understand. Visible design is the concept that products should be as visible as they need to be. For example, the click wheel of this era of iPod. The shape and the tactile nature of the buttons both made the intended interaction super, use, super obvious, but also made scrolling through thousands of songs even more enjoyable in the process. One of John Mader's laws of simplicity is reduce. The simplest way to achieve simplicity is through thoughtful reduction. A summary of the book on his website says, when in doubt, just remove, but be careful what you remove. Sometimes less is just less. For example, sometimes labels are removed and icons left in their place. Whilst the interface looks simpler, this is often an increase in complexity. Knowledge makes everything simpler know when to leave your labels. Good design, when it's done well, becomes invisible. It's only when it's done poorly that we notice it. Number six, design principles. It might be that you stop jumping on the bandwagon of certain design trends, but it definitely doesn't mean skipping out on the basics. This seems pretty straightforward, but I think it's worth including. For example, you've designed your footer and you realise that you've got a combination of links and labels and it's not super clear which ones are which, so you add some underlines. Now it doesn't look so good. Often I find this is the point where it's easy to get frustrated, especially if someone else pointed out that maybe underlines would be a good idea. I'm including this not to tell you that you should think about hierarchy, but to, as a reminder that you already know how to design. You're going to have to change things, especially when you're not familiar with accessibility. But that doesn't mean that your design is slowly going to get less aesthetically pleasing. You just might have to take a step back and rethink something that you never paid that much attention to before. Number seven, embrace the challenge. 
Designing within constraints leads to more creativity and creativity leads to aesthetically pleasing websites that are just all round better. Throughout history, there have been loads of examples of things that have been created specifically to make something more accessible that have gone on to make a significant impact on how we live our daily lives. So to finish, here are a few. The keyboard. The first typing machine was created in the early 1800s by an Italian inventor and a countess that could be a friend, could be a lover, I'm not sure. The countess was slowly losing her vision and they created a machine that pressed letters into a sheet of paper so that you could continue so that they could continue to communicate privately. Their typing machine has led to the modern day keyboard, which I'm sure the majority of us have already used this morning. Curb cuts, or those gentle slopes from the footpath to the road, were originally created for wheelchair users, but they've become so common that we barely even notice them. They benefit so many people, parents with a push chair, a courier pushing a heavy load, someone pulling a wheeled shopping bag. Touchscreen. Wayne Westerman, who had severe carpal tunnel syndrome, wanted to invent a way to use the computer that required no force of hand. His company, Fingerworks, created a keyboard alternative that involved having a touchpad for each hand. The technology was sold to Apple in 2005 and led to the launch of the very first iPhone. In 1972, Julia Child, the French chef, was the first episode to air with captioning. This has had a massive impact. With age, nearly everyone experiences hearing loss, but captioning has been even more widespread. It's used in noisy spaces like airports and pubs. It's helped people to learn new languages. And it's also become one of the main ways that people engage with video content on social media, with many people opting for reading captions instead of turning up the volume. Accessibility, when it's done well, just makes everything better. In summary, focus on people, know enough to ask questions, and remember that you already know how to design. Thank you for listening to me today.